congratulations on being five, by the way. And uh, yeah, thank you yeah. for asking me. Five years old, you're very welcome. Thank you for coming. I was uh, listening to my favourite Bowie album, Lodger. And we're on Fantastic Voyage. And uh, the news came through that he died. And I thought, no, there surely must be some mistake. Can't be so. And it was so. And I was reading a book by Frank O'Connor, Irish short, short story writer called The Backward Look, all about 9th century Irish poetry. So I wrote David, <laughs> his poem called The Backward Look. The blackbird leaves me a note pinned to the sky that blue beyond blue, the tide of the moment turning, turning, time like apple blossom falling through my mind, the little boy unable to believe that this day is not made of forever and only now. I walk back through myself to unpin the note the blackbird wrote with his voice still pinned to that self-same sky. The blue so still beyond even itself. I at last able to read the bird's words, its language a secret no longer to me. I sing, it says, I sing because all of this must die. I sing the moment's tide, its turning, always turning its throat full of song, glorying and being alive for this one eternal moment. Thank you. Oh, Lord, that was beautiful, Donal. Apple blossom through my mind. Crikey. Yeah, that's the way it is. Ah. Um, I had a friend called Barbara and she was <laughs> married to oh, a brutal brute of a man. He was just a monster. And we all begged her to leave him. She wouldn't leave him. She said, oh, he still loves me and all that. And he used to beat her so badly. And she was a petite, slight little thing. And I managed to get her away to a refuge. And uh, when I did, I, I got to know her physical torment because he bit me to a pulp. He knocked, knocked me senseless, unconscious, uh, to find out where she'd gone. <laughs> wow. I didn't tell him. Uh, so she said... I wish I could write poetry like you, and uh, I don't want my voice and my story to be lost, so will you write me a poem? So I wrote her this. It's called, I Wear Long Sleeves Even in Summer. Blue bruises bloom on my skin. I wear long sleeves even in summer. The memory of his flashing fists, even the memory hurts. First I lost my smile, it somehow floated away. Blue bruises bloom on my skin. Next I lost my flesh until I was nothing but skin and bone. My curves, my breasts vanished into themselves. All something is grass, I quoted to myself. I wear long sleeves even in summer. The woman in the mirror who claims she's me isn't, isn't. A stranger holds my eye, I, I look away. Blue bruises bloom on my skin. I wear long sleeves even in summer. She is now married to a lovely woman called Barbara. So it's the two Barbaras and they have a lovely adopted daughter. So you can escape. Yay. Yay, Yay. So happily, ho hopefully she's happily ever after too. Yes, I, I, I hope so. <laughs> I, I won't name the man because as Prospero says, to name is just to say his name would infect my mouth altogether. Mm. He was just mm. a brute. He didn't deserve to be human at all. Mm. <laughs> This is called uh, Cheval à Bascou Long Fou, which means rock and horse on fire. She keeps the room just as it was, as if death had never entered it. Still turns the eider down down, still straightens sheets, still plumps pillows, brings breakfast every morning just like before, but there is no before anymore. Even the future has vanished. One day it hurts her, this haunting, the room has become a shrine and she its priestess. So she decides to burn the past. The wind turns the pages as, they, as books flame. Dulls melt in the witch hunt. A rocking horse is on fire. Go now, she commands. These are only things. She hides her daughter in her heart where nothing can touch her. The fire reflected in her tears. And this one is. Oh, in her <laughs> I don't know if you know French antique uh, rocking horses, but they're very expensive, very beautiful. And she just thought the only way I can escape this. She was in a car crash, and she crashed the car, and her daughter died. So 
guilt was amazing altogether. This wow. is called How I Discovered I Was a Boy. Growing up in a family of seven sisters, I thought I was just another sister until my breast didn't grow and I realised it wasn't so. Thank you. The most transformative thing in my life was my big sister and I had lots of big sisters and two other sisters came after me so I just thought I was a sister. Uh, uh, my sister Junie uh, totally transformed how I saw. She, uh, my, my other big sister would, you could see her mentally ratching down to come to this little boy go chick, 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 chick. Hello little boy who is my brother. Junie didn't do that. Junie treated me as an equal and she just walked into my head. I don't know how, how she done it, but she just lifted the latch and walked in and she allowed me to walk into her head so that I could see how, as a woman, she encountered the world and I could, uh, she let me see through her seeing. So I saw through her seeing and uh, she tuned me into that female frequency. Oh, that's where I exist still to this day. You tune, tune me back to male and I go, ah, it's all static and I don't want to be there, thank you. <laughs> Uh, and this that's, is me that's when really I. really interesting, um, Donald, because yeah. I, I, you know, I used to teach too, and and I could always tell the um, the boys that had big sisters. Uh, mm. uh, they sure help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is called its own good self, and this is me growing up in a Catholic uh, country and having it shoved down my neck and I thought I'd never escape the bloody thing altogether. But I was five. I had my own religion for God's sake. I had the religion of me and what I saw and how I encountered the world. So this is called its own good self. No God, just the sweet rain blesses me with its own good self. A robin unaware that he's my prayer. The miracle of sunlight playing with a kitten. Wind sings in a choir of trees. Now where am I? Ugh. Well, you can you can you can just do you know what? You could read that again to me. That was so lovely. I can't find it now. <laughs> there we go. Its own good self. No God, just the sweet rain blesses me with its own good self. A robin, unaware that he's my prayer. The miracle of sunlight playing with a kitten. Wind sings in a choir of trees. Ooh, that was my religion. <laughs> I didn't yeah, need. No, I didn't need the other stuff. <laughs> I didn't want the other stuff. To me, Donald, the, what, the prayer of a robin is it lovely? A robin's prayer. Bloody gorgeous. Now I was reading in. Uh, oh, where was it? The Opera House in uh, in Jersey, and I was going through the the airport scanner thing, and I bleeped. And I took off nearly most everything and I bleeped again. I took off <laughs> ridiculous and I still bleeped. And the guy came up to me and he said, excuse me, sir, but can I look through your hair? <laughs> so he got my hair and all he found was these curly thoughts and, uh, you know, ridiculous. But uh, I, the same thing happened in Dublin. But in Dublin, you have a sense of humor and they'll play back with you. So entirely different. This is called barefoot or writing barefoot. Being frisked at Dublin Airport, what's that in your back pocket? An unfinished poem, I admit ruefully. Is it metal, he asks? No, it's mental, I tell him. You know, a bunch of words hanging about the piece of paper? Go on, Richie, he smirks. And next time, remove your shoes. On the plane, I kick off my shoes and finish the unfinished poem. Now, I always write barefoot. <laughs> what do you say? He taught me a lot. This has got me mam's mind. It's in memory of my mother, Rita. If you fall off that wall and break both your legs, don't come running to me. Could never understand my mam's mind and how it worked. One moment she had half a mind to come up there and get me off that wall. Then, then she was in two minds about whether to tell me to stop. Go ahead. Go ahead. And kill yourself. See if I care. I'm warning you, child. If you fall off that wall and kill yourself, I'll personally come up there and murder you myself, so I will. I used to watch the words climbing out of her mouth and fly around the room, looking for a place to land in my mind. 
Never cared whether she gave out. I just loved everything she said, the music of her and how she made the words behave. I came down and kissed her, kissed her worry away. I'm sorry, ma'am, I told her, and she cried. And that was the, the day that, as a six-year-old child, I grew up when I realised that other people can hurt and you can hurt them, so. Oh. This is called In the World Was as Simple as Snow. I wanted to write a love poem for Jan, but I wanted to write a different type of love poem for Jan, so this is a different type of love poem. You are like all the dark shops of my childhood, where you enter with the little tinkle of a bell and the world blossoms into a myriad of things colourful to sell, stacked in impossible and impeccable order, all yelling, shining, glinting, wild and glassy, and the cash register singing with the hard-earned money, and the little tinkle of a bell lets you out again into a world excited with the falling of snow and the palpable approach of a Christmas when Christmas was Christmas and the world was as simple as snow. I used to save all year, my sister Junie used to help me to buy my mother the eternal present of 4711. <laughs> and she, God help her, she'd open it and say, Oh, isn't that lovely? <laughs> As if she'd never got it before and wasn't going to get it next year. An old spice for my dad. And I used to save all my pennies for a year when everybody else was licking lollipops and in the middle of the summer, I'd save my money so I could buy uh, my parents their presents. <laughs> now, I don't know if you know a song called Comes Love. It's from ah, when? 1939, uh, old jazz standard. Uh, I love it. And my little girl loved it as well. And I used to sing to my little girl when she was a baby, when she was just born, when she was a toddler. All the time I used to sing her. Uh, everything. Beatles, everything. Um, but she particularly liked this song called Comes Love. So this is called Comes a Mousy. Comes a headache, you can lose it in a day. Comes a true Turk, she did not dentist right away. Comes love, <coughs> nothing can be done. She wiggles her fingers, she wriggles her toes, <laughs> tries to mouth the words. She gurgles in her cot, waves her head about, hits her mobile ties. I sing her old jazz standards from the first day of her life, from tiny tot. To the toddler of now, she can join in and sing with relish and delight. And the man of daddy, sing me mousy, sing me mousy. Comes the measles, you can quarantine a room. Comes a mousy, you can chase it with a broom. Comes love, <coughs> nothing can be done. Comes love, nothing can be done. Comes love, ha, nothing can be done. Thank you. And this is called the lost. Maybe the end. This is called the last, uh, the lost moments of childhood. Uh, when I was five, I, I, you know, there still are pictures in my mind. I can still walk into them like movies. Uh, they didn't vanish, and just all these little moments, insignificant, uh, put together, and uh, they came back, and now I can express them and say them. So this is called the lost moments of childhood return. The trees stop running, the hills slow down, the station arrives at the train. He felt if he were to let go of the tightly held red balloon, he would float away into the forever. The silence settles upon him like invisible snow, even the noise is quiet. The teacher speaks to him in visible italics, sarcasm st staining the space between them. The teacher shouts in capitals, he cringes in lower case, rubbing himself out. A snowfall of dust upon the snail's back, sunlight shifts from foot to foot. A sunbeam slices through the attic's ages, motes pretend they're atoms. The night, like black blotting paper, observes him bit by bit. A yellow brick on a red brick on the ho-ho-ho of Christmas, my tonsils no longer mine. Fields dozing under an unrelenting sun, trees walking in shimmer. In the space between second and second, he sees the world as it is. The world too big to pack into the little words he knew. Thank you. Whoa. I'd love to see that on the page. I mean, crikey, he, you know, the teacher shouts in capital, the, the student cringes in lowercase. I mean, mm. that's phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. Respect. <laughs> 
effect. This is called Jerry Sweeney's Mammy. And uh, when I was a little fella, I didn't know anything of sex or where babies came from. My wife is bringing me up to speed now. I'm getting good, Jen, I'm Oh, you are. Yeah, yeah that's oh, good. Yes. Uh, so I suffered under the assumption that a chap can have two mammies. And Mrs. Sweeney up the road was also my mammy. And my Auntie Mary down in Cork was also my mammy. And um, my definition of a mammy was somebody who loved you so much, that much beyond belief. And that was my definition of a mammy. And uh, my dad, by that definition, was the best mammy I ever had. So this is me mother bringing me aside and saying, you know Mrs. Sweeney is not your mammy, don't you? And I go, what? Are you kidding me? So this is to Mrs. Sweeney. I heard that she died and I never got back to see her. Uh, so I wrote her this poem. It's called Jerry Sweeney's Mammy. Mrs. Sweeney was Jerry Sweeney's mammy. And even though I had my own, I had her on loan. It was like having a spare mammy. And even when she was mad with us, ah, she just couldn't be mad with us. Go on, she grinned. Go on. You'd wear the heart out of a stone. And if you fell and you were crying, your heart and knee badly grazed or badly bitten by a bee, she would hug you up with all of herself. Ah, come here to me, you poor little dose. Wrap you up in so much love it would last for years, for years. Jerry Sweeney was my best friend ever, in the way back then. Still is, nothing's changed, except as young fellas have become old fellas who still think they're young fellas. And every time I see him, I could almost cry. I can still see his mammy smiling out of his eyes. Thank you. <laughs> and I'll read you the last poem of the book. It's called, Now He Is Sixty. I went into school and uh, I was teaching, well, year seven. And uh, or year eight and year seven were very funny. They, I said, what did you do last class? And they said, uh, I don't know. And then one guy at the back popped, uh, piped up and said, we was doing Anne of Cleavage, sir. And I thought, right, I better not go there. <laughs> Anne of Cleavage, huh? And what were you doing before Anne of Cleavage then? And he said, they all said, we don't know. And the guy at the back piped up and he said, the spinach armada, sir. So the next day, I brought in all this spinach and some oranges from Seville, and we bombarded the spinach armada. And the head teacher came in during that bit and thought, oh, God almighty. Then I went on to year eight. And this is the story. They'll never of... forget that, though. You, you obviously haven't either, but they will never forget that. Oh, they didn't, they didn't. This is gone now we're 60, because I was just coming up to my 60th birthday. A year eight child inquires... Oh yeah, the thing they were doing is I'd ask a question and everybody would reply in a oh, arr, pirate voice. And it wasn't pirate day and they just kept doing that to me. So I just did it back to them and they thought, well, that's no fun if he's going to do it as well. <laughs> a year eight child inquires how old I be. I be just 60. He gasps. My God, you're very active for 60. 60 for him is a distant planet in a galaxy far, far from here. Yea, another dimension. I smile, my 60-year-old smile, perfected by now. I am starlight that will only reach him when he is 60 himself, if he ever remembers what he has long ago forgotten. Now that's it this time. <laughs> tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be Bruce Willis. I mean, tonight, Sarah, I'm going to attempt to be Donald Dempsey, or the best Donald Dempsey I can be anyway. Uh, two poems with a, and then a tiny little coda. This is called After the Row. Built an overlarge snowman on your front doorstep and hid behind it. Rang your doorbell until you were annoyed by it. Yes, yes, you flung open the door to be confronted with a snowman telling you he loved you until slowly your heart began to melt. Thank you. Ah, this is a I need to get slightly undressed for this. This is um, uh -oh. a delightful little ditty called uh, Autopsy. You made the opening incision with almost clinical precision. Took the heart out. Found it wanting. Took the top off the head. Removed the mind. What exactly was it you expected to find? I looked at you with sad eyes that said... It wouldn't have hurt half as much if you'd only waited till I was dead. 
and the coda is apple of my eye. Although I loved you more and more, you were rotten to the core. I don't love you anymore. Thank you. <laughs> Fabulous.